that's that I've dreamed of. It's gonna happen, and I will do what I can. So welcome everyone to the third event in the warm-up series uh, as we lead up to the Euroheat and Power Congress 2021. Um, my name is Jack Riscadden and I'm a project officer with the DHC Plus technology platform and I will be your moderator for today. And so this is actually our second event on sec sector integration today. Um, earlier on we had the Magnitude Policy Workshop titled Energy Integration from Policy to Action. And just a few quickly, a few of the key messages that um, came out of the workshop today. So collaboration between different actors and sectors is key to achieving the goals of sector integration and a climate neutral Europe by 2050. Um, coordinated infrastructure planning is essential when making strategic decisions about the, um, the location um, and type of future energy infrastructure. And district heating and cooling has a key role to play in deep decarbonization at local level and a level, level playing field is needed for all providers of flexibility um, in terms of aggregation and taxation of electricity and what type of technology is used and digital digitalization storage uh, data handling prosumers are all key enablers of energy sector integration and the provision of flexibility so the european electricity or sorry the european energy system is still built on several uh, vertical and siloed energy fields, um, which rigidly link specific resources to specific end use sectors. Um, energy system integration or the coordinated planning and operation of the system as a whole across multiple carriers and pathways is the, the pathway towards an effective and deep decarbonization of the European energy system. Um, and this is essential to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, by enhancing the synergies between different energy carriers, uh, increased flexibility can be provided to the electricity sector as well as the overall system. Um, so multi-energy systems involving different technologies, different energy vectors um, can facilitate the integration of renewable sources uh, and reduce overall primary energy demand. And these multi-energy systems can uh, participate in a variety of flexibility markets uh, when they are aggregated together, as was explored uh, in the Magnitude project. So what does this mean from a district heating and cooling perspective? So a more integrated and optimized uh, energy system offers both opportunities and challenges for district heating and cooling. So while widespread electrification may limit the role of district heating in some areas, um, these heat networks are ideally placed to become the a flexible backbone of the future energy system. And sector integration through heat networks enables the integration of renewables and the capture of waste heat uh, available from both industry and unconventional sources within urban environments. Um, and thermal storage can work to reduce peak loads while district cooling um, is an essential technology in addressing Europe's rising heat demand, sorry, rising cooling demand. And following increased uh, policy attention in recent years, the future of district heating and cooling as part of uh, an overall integrated system looks very bright. And <clears throat> we will now move on to uh, our speakers today. Back on. Yeah, so our speakers today um, will showcase the latest research uh, on the integration between the heating and cooling and electricity sectors. Um, and their presentations will highlight um, some cutting edge research around energy integration with examples from the ground. Um, so we'll start off with a presentation from Johan Kensby, who is the CEO and CTO and co-founder of Utilifeed, a company that revolutionizes the way district energy companies work with data-driven design, analysis and optimization across their whole value chain. Um, so Johan has a PhD in smart energy systems and today we'll speak about the FlexiSync project um, which is the, he is responsible for the implementation of district heating flexibility. This will be followed by a presentation from Euro Salabir, who is the strategic innovation department director at Ellis, the Slovenian TSO. Um, Euro has worked at Ellis for 20 years with a focus on management and coordination of power systems operations, electricity markets, infrastructure projects, and technical information systems. And Yorosh is also the vice chair of the NSOE Research and Development Committee. And then Alan Nilsson will join us for the Q&A session. Um, 
Anna holds an MSc in Energy Systems Engineering and is currently working as a project manager at IVL, the Swedish Environmental Research Institute. Uh, she is also the coordinator of the FlexiSync project and has prev previously worked at one of Slo um, Sweden's largest DSOs. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to pass over to uh, Johan for the first presentation today. Thank you very much, Jack, for uh, the introduction. So I'm here today representing uh, the FlexiSync project, which is a big uh, research uh, project which, with uh, both uh, industrial partners, uh, research partners, and cities uh, in it, where we work to make the best use of uh, flexibility. And I'm the leader of Work Package 4, uh, where we actually build uh, and test the practical implementation of flexibility in these systems. Uh, so today I will talk uh, first a bit about how we, what is flexibility and how we characterize it, then how we technically enable the use of flexibility in the solution, and then how we take that flexibility into an energy system optimization and optimize how we use it from a system perspective. But before I dive into that, I should say a little bit on uh, why we are doing this. And in the energy system, there's an increasing share of renewables and they often have an uh, intermittent uh, characteristic. So, with, with, shifting, uh, with both shifting demand and supply all the, all the time, um, the environmental impact and cost of energy varies each hour. And in such a circumstance, um, it's very, very good that we have a strong sector coupling between the electrical grid and the district heating and cooling systems. And this coupling comes both from combined heat and power plants, which produce both electricity and heat at the same time. At the same time, the um, heating grids and cooling grids are also consumers of electricity through the use of heat pumps and even some direct electrical heating. And there's also buildings with several heat sources. It's getting more and more common to have buildings with uh, both a heat pump and a district heating solution connected to them. And in heating and cooling system, there are large amounts of uh, very cost effective flexibility that can be utilized. And thanks to this strong coupling to the electrical grid, this flexibility can not only be utilized directly in the heating and cooling system, it also gives the district energy systems uh, the opportunity to become a balancing uh, force in the electrical grid. And there are some key challenges uh, with putting all this into practice. Uh, first, you need a system perspective in, in basically everything you do since everything varies each hour and everything is interconnected. And this all comes down to the need of a fairly complex uh, system optimization. And also, it, um, there are many parties involved and you do some actions in the buildings that brings benefits in other parts of the system. So you need uh, a business model that takes that into account and distributes the value that's created. But diving into the characteristics of flexibility, I should start with what, what I actually mean by flexibility in this context. If we look at the district heating and cooling system, we have production units, we have the distribution grid, and we have the consumers. And the actual flexibility, it is uh, everything that adds a degree of freedom to this system. So for example, you can vary the supply temperature in the distribution grid, or in the buildings, you can vary how much heat you, uh, the heating system uses, if thanks to the thermal inertia in the buildings. And you also have a lot of operational flexibility on the production side and, and storage units. And this flexibility is, is partially distributed across the, the system and uh, parts of it is also very time dependent. So it's not all, not all flexibility is always available. 
And the key question to first answer is how much flexibility is available in a system. And in, in order to do this, we need to build a really good uh, model of the system that describes how all the components are connected and how they operate. And we use this optimization model traditionally to minimize the operational cost and the CO2 emissions uh, from, the, from the system. And the more flexibility uh, we have, the more options on how we operate the system uh, we have. But we should also keep uh, in mind that by adding all this flexibility and components, it also increases the complexity of the model and increases the risk of us doing errors. So we should keep it sim simple and keep a tight balance where we model it as accurately as we need to without uh, making it overly complicated. And generally, when you increase the amount of flexibility in such a system, uh, you, re you relax the constraints and it gives the optimization better condition to find an operational plan which result in lower operational costs and lower CO2 uh, emissions. And that's where the benefit comes from. And a bit about how we put this uh, flexibility into practice. And in this project, we have a big focus on the demand side flexibility in the buildings. And traditionally, the heating system is demand driven. The building can take out any amount of heat it wants at any given time. And then the, the energy system just have to react to it. But if you look at what's actually needed in the building, you want a good indoor climate and that can be achieved in many ways. For example, if I make a step response in the control signal of a heating system in the building, it, the building have a large thermal inertia. So it will take a long time before it have a significant impact uh, on the actual indoor temperature and thermal comfort in the building. And this is what we utilize uh, with one type of flexibility in this project. Uh, so by doing this, we can shift significant amounts of heat demand in time without a major impact on the indoor climate. And the graphs here uh, to the right shows an example of this. So uh, if we send a control signal to a building marked A here in the graph, we get the response that the supply temperature in the heating system, the radiate system in the building drops. And that has an impact, a pretty big impact on the heat uh, supply to the building, the blue line here in the bottom graph. So we can, by that, uh, in that way, we can adjust the heat demand quite a lot while the effect on the indoor climate is still very small. And in this system, or in this project, uh, a company called Nuda is involved, which have a solution for uh, the control systems in the building where they aggregate this flexibility uh, for many buildings and makes it available uh, for, for our energy system optimization to utilize. And they are not only working with this type of flexibility I just described, where we shift heat demand in time, but also buildings which have both district heating and heat pump. Uh, there's a flexibility where we can choose at every, every given point in time which heat source is prioritized. And we want to make this choice based on what is on the margin in the heating system and what is in the, on the margin in the electrical grid at each point in time. And this flexibility is then utilized in an energy system optimization. And that's what we are working mostly with uh, in my company, Utilifeed, in this project that we develop an energy system optimization that makes use of the best use of this flexibility from a system perspective. And we set up a communication where um, the flexibility, the available flexibility in the buildings the forecast for that for the upcoming hours and days is sent through data feed to an API to a cloud platform where the energy system optimization is done. So that goes into the optimization as model parameters and constraints each time a production plan is being made. And then the optimal uh, utilization of flexibility is calculated in the production plan 
and that is then sent back to the buildings as a control plan and is then executed over the upcoming hours and days. And in this project, we have developed a tool where it is easy for energy companies or district heating operators uh, to run this type of optimizations every day in their uh, daily production planning. And it looks something uh, like this, what you see to the right. Uh, and it does not only support uh, the demand flexibility, we also have the flexibility in the distribution grid. And this is a big contribution from uh, Lule University, which are working with a really good model for, uh, for how we can vary the supply temperature, both to minimize losses and use the grid as a thermal storage that's also implemented in the optimization solution. And this is going to be tested very soon in six cities. We have three demo sites in Sweden. Uh, we also have uh, Berlin, Maria Lage uh, in Austria, and then uh, Palma in Spain. And this tool is not only used for planning the optimal use of flexibility in the upcoming hours and days, we also use it to run longer simulations over different uh, years and the cold winter, hot winter, uh, etc. And that is that is something you can do before you make investments in, for example, flexibility. You can simulate your whole system with and without different types of flexibility and see how much you can reduce your operational cost and the carbon emissions to make the assessment if this is something you should invest in or not. And a little bit under the hood of such an energy system optimization works. So tradi traditionally, when you plan how to operate a heating grid, you have a, 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 a traditional control logic and the merit order of your different boilers. But if you take into account how it interacts with the electrical grid through electrical trading, both buying and selling, all types of flexibility and uh, and all including different types of storage when you plan how to run the system one hour you need to take the full optimization horizon into account so you need to set the whole plan at once in one big optimization problem so basically what we do is that we create a digital twin all of this can just be broken down to a huge set of equations and then we feed it uh, to very powerful optimization solvers that then have the target function. How should this system be operated each individual hour in order to have the lowest total operational cost over the whole period? And this is uh, possible to do in such complex pro problems thanks to recent development in really powerful tools and optimization solvers. And with this approach, it's also possible to take probability into account in the optimization, for example, confidence interval for different forecasts, for example, for the heating demand or uh, the electricity price. And the most important input when you do a production plan, it's the forecast of uh, the heat demand in the system. And this is something we've been working quite a lot with in the project. And traditionally, when you do this, you create a model based on how you have produced, how much heat you needed to produce previously in similar conditions. But this is not the, really the actual heat demand. So what we do instead here is that we aggregate the demand on all buildings uh, in the grid. And for some demo sites, this is several thousands of buildings. We aggregate and validate that data and we make a forecast that is actually the aggregated forecast for the consumer side. So this increases accuracy. And then we also use uh, state-of-the-art machine learning that is specifically tailored for this use case. And we have validated the model on over 50,000 uh, substations. So then you get something like what you see here to the right, not only a forecast for energy, but you also get the forecast, for example, for the return temperature in the grid. And this is really valuable input when we do when we include the distribution grid model in the optimization because the temperature and volume flows is 
the needed input for, for, for making such a model in a good way. And you don't only get uh, the most probable demand, you also get the confidence interval, which is the blue area here. So you can also use that uh, in your optimization. So right now uh, we're about halfway through the project and this year will be a lot about uh, wrapping, wrapping up all the tools we're developing and start testing them at the different uh, demo sites. And if you think this sounds uh, interesting, you can look into the website uh, of the project. There you can sign up for newsletters. Um, we have uh, webinars every quarter. Or if you have uh, any direct questions or want to test anything of this in your own grid, you are also very welcome to uh, contact me directly. So thank you very much. And I'm now very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Johan. I particularly like the approach to modeling flexibility and that it should be as complicated as necessary and as simple as possible. Um, we just have one quick question. Um, is, do you have any results or preliminary results on uh, the economic value or the CO2 reduction delivered by the optimization approach that you've outlined? Uh, yes, um, I'd say that right when we started this project, we did a pre-study using the same optimization model in another project, which is called the value of flexible heat demand. And that is published if you want to uh, get it in full. Um, so we simulated this in uh, six different cities. And if you make a, a wide application in many buildings of this type of flexibility, you can actually reduce your operational cost of the whole system with between two and eight percent. And for like a medium sized uh, city in, in Swedish conditions, you could save about uh, one to two thousand tons uh, of carbon dioxide emissions annually. And I should say that is for uh, a heating grid, which already today have very low carbon emissions with only 2% uh, fossil fuels in it. So it will likely be much higher uh, in some other grids. Great, so lots of meaningful savings there. Well, well thanks again, Yo uh, Johan. And yeah, we'll, we'll um, call you back and we'll um, focus more on this flexibility during the Q&A. So yeah, I'll now pass over to Jura Salabir for the next presentation. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, thank you for having me today. Um, yes, my name is Uro Salabir. I come from a transmission, transmission system operator of Slovenia. Uh, it's um, a company responsible for electricity part of the energy system on the top level, on, on the uh, levels be beyond distribution. Uh, but actually, the, the, the thing which I will talk about today is, is more the movement, the transformation on the state level than a project. I will not talk about specific project uh, uh, which is going on here in Slovenia, but it's more about um, what we believe should be done on the level of, of the member states uh, in order to, to really get into the action in terms of reaching the uh, 2050 targets on, on the relation between uh, energy vectors. And um, I will be very much focused into this uh, coupling of uh, power and heat. And I will take some elements of the Slovenian case, but I would guess that many of these elements could also be applicable elsewhere. Um, so for the start, let me say that um, uh, this is still the number which is shaking me because uh, when we checked the consumption on the household level and uh, we, we compared electricity with, uh, with heat, it, it turned out to be uh, extremely in the or direction of heat. So uh, the heat demand cannot be uh, disregarded. and. Uh, if we try to optimize uh, the systems from the electricity point of view, and if we believe that the electricity part will become more important and uh, will gain more and more with time, we have to be careful here because the, 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 the size of these two systems and 
and the, 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 the energy behind uh, is, is almost uncomparable. And I will uh, show the next slide, which actually talks about this number. So what are we talking here about? I'm, I'm again on the household level for Slovenia, but if you just see how much heat is today used uh, from electricity, so produced by electricity, that's like uh, one terawatt hour for Slovenia. And we have another terawatt hour of, of, of natural gas. More than that, we have more than one terawatt hour coming from oil for heat. And there is a biomass supply of almost five uh, terawatt hours. And that means that we are actually in a situation that if all these sources will, will merge or di di direct into, into the electricity system, you can imagine how bigger the electricity system should be. So I, as an electricity uh, engineer, believe that, that this is really uh, very hardly to be met. So, so there must be other solutions. And um, if I again look into, into the views of, of, of the electricity experts, or, or let me say the people which are very much in, in, in this, in this uh, environment, the typical way of, of these new trends is to go with some new electricity sources like photovoltaics. In Slovenia, this is a very important source because we don't have much wind. Uh, it could be wind or other. And then we somehow imagine that, that uh, smart grids and physical grids and combination with heat pumps will be the future trend. Of course, this is also a bit coupled with uh, things going on in the immobility and, and, and other stuff. But, but I would say this is a very ego, uh, I would say electricity centric uh, solution. And uh, uh, so power system, power like electricity system, egocentric solution. This is not what uh, uh, we believe is the right way of work, even if this is quite predominant uh, way of thinking. And uh, the question why we need to go into cross-sector coupling for us is actually the, the question of what will happen with, uh, with the infrastructure? What will happen with the tariffs? What will happen with, uh, with the price of energy? And I'm showing here a, a very simple graph where you can see that if we take today's network chargers, uh, for Slovenia, this is like 7.5 uh, cents for, 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 for kilowatt, uh, uh, we will get into this green infrastructure formation phase in the next years, which will raise our network tariffs. And this, this is, this is uh, going to happen in any way. Whatever we try to do, we cannot avoid uh, this increase to happen. It's a question of how much this increase will happen, but, but it will definitely happen. Um, now, the, the next phase, which will come after this formation phase, after all these investment cycles will happen, will be some sort of uh, exploitation, optimization. So this will be the time when, when we have the systems done and ready, and then we're starting to use it, and then we still find some better ways and, and so. And here, the big question is, are we going to get back to today? So are we expecting that our so-called green premium, which is today used as a term for this uh, for part, will get back to zero? So if we have to increase the, the chargers, are we going to, to get back to, 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 to today's day? But if, if not, then we might stay on these new levels or we, we might even go up. And this is something what we are really connecting with uh, the way how we are going to approach this cross-sector coupling. If we do it in the right way, if the right players are on the table and they do the right stuff, we believe that the green premium could be reduced back to zero. Otherwise, we are not so sure. So um, the approach in Slovenia, which will be taken, is actually uh, consisting of uh, three, uh, I would say, steps. Uh, building up new roles and responsibilities. Uh, we already discussed today the digital twins. So we see that we need to go into this joint development of cross-sector digital twins. We want to base these twins on the bottom-up approach. So we want to go to the field to the data, we, we have the sources and we need to go into the ge geographical uh, dimension of the problem because th there is the 
current infrastructure if we want to have a good estimate and if we want to really make a solution for each and individual part of, of the consumer, uh, I would say, geographical area, we need to do a very good uh, replication of, of the current state and the future potential. And uh, the third step is very important. I think this is what is really missing today. Uh, we need to initiate this cross-sector investment project. So I, I have to highlight the word investment. It's not enough to go just for pilots or research. Uh, the, the partners must connect because of the need for common investment. These investments today and the future will not be so easy as in the past. We, we even don't know exactly what solutions are the best one. There are players which have very different roles and they have very different directions. And if they just do uh, some research together, this will not be enough. Even the, if the states make some plans, you never know what gets into this plan. So only if these partnerships are created and uh, oriented into investment uh, dimension, we believe that uh, this can be done properly. Now, um, so when I talk, I go back to the roles and responsibilities, we shouldn't forget that we are connecting electric, gas, oil, heating, and transport sector. We should not forget that we're connecting market and non-market stakeholders. This is very important because we as uh, non-market stakeholders in the past 20 years were forbidden to collaborate with market stakeholders. And this must change here because if we just do it from one or the other perspective, it will not work. Of course, utilities and end users also have to be closely tied in, in these uh, uh, collaborations and partnerships, which will be actually also supported by these new roles. If I go to the digital twins, uh, as already mentioned uh, uh, by Johan, so it's important uh, to start like always with the planning to do the demand forecast for 2050 or for those years, which are very critical in this uh, direction. We shouldn't just look into 10 years perspective. We have to go really uh, deep in that scenarios. And, um, and we have to look into the yearly time, time span. So if you imagine Slovenian case with a lot of photovoltaics today in the process, but yes, this must also be combined uh, with uh, solar, solar heat systems. So uh, we need to look to the whole year because the winter time will be critical and we have to have solutions which will solve that. What is also important is that we should intrinsically find what is the real need for the heat in 2050? What will be the real need of the electricity at that time? Because a lot of the electricity might be used for heat, but we have to scrap everything and, and get to the real need of electricity. And then we have to get to the same need of the transport, but not in, 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 in terms of energy vectors, but in terms of, of the of the of the presence of, of the exact uh, transport needs. And, and you shouldn't forget, yes, the transport is getting into our houses, the charging of vehicles is getting closer to our households and that energy needs will also have to be supplied through, through these uh, cross-sector uh, systems. Um, when we have these demands for 2050, uh, well done, we know, of course, it, it should be scenario building, but uh, we should be ready for, if, if not all, most of these scenarios, which could uh, uh, get in the way. Then from this demand part, we have to go into this infrastructure planning part, uh, again, on the long term. This should include electrical grids, uh, heating networks as very important elements. And, and this is the part which is the most critical because we will have to combine all the possible heat sources. For example, for Slovenia, the biomass must be very clearly um, uh, structured and identified. And we have to check how we can better uh, use the biomass available because there is a huge discrepancy between market biomass and the actual used biomass. And, the, and it's combined with ownership of, of the woods and, and everything is very, very complicated in this case. But this will also be one of the part of the solutions for Slovenia. So what we, uh, I'm now moving into this last part of the presentation, uh, just two slides to finish. So I will now talk about what I mean when I say we need to create investment partnerships. So ALS today 
is in the middle of the process of creating uh, uh, a national partnership where the government of Slovenia, the regulators, and uh, the, the stakeholders will play uh, a, a common, a common uh, in, in a common direction. So at the moment we are uh, reaching out, we have found uh, partners in three different regions of Slovenia. We have different uh, heating retailers. Uh, we have different uh, DNOs, uh, DSOs, uh, institutes involved. But, but we uh, really look for, for the real case investments, uh, which will actually serve the customers from, from the uh, mid to long term perspective. And, and these partnership targets uh, are, of course, to go with solutions which are not just for the next 10 years, but actually should go to 2040 and beyond. Uh, we have to take into account all the local specifics. So this is why I say we are working on a bottom-up approach uh, in, in terms of data. We have to be seasonally resistant and we have to already think about reproduction of these locations and these solutions to other locations. Very important part. So we have to not only pilot if needed. So that's that's one of the poles. So if we need some new solutions, we will go for pilots. But pilots are not uh, necessarily part of this because we just want to have the solutions which will be reproducible on other locations. Uh, of course, we have to take into account all possible technologies, power system, DHC, renewable energy sources, storage. Everything should be there. Storage, electrical or heat. Uh, this is all part of it. And the last uh, bullet and also the last uh, element of my presentation is that, um, you know, this replication usually in, in, in projects, uh, especially in, in, in R&D projects, it comes after the project is finished. But, but this is not good for such partnership. Uh, replication has to be part of the partnership. So partnership should develop in direction, in direction of replication so that everything stays under the same umbrella, and we just keep going and finishing the job uh, in the in the area of the national state. Okay, so that was uh, from my side, Jack. Thank you, Yorosh, for highlighting some of the challenges um, facing the Slovenian energy sector, which indeed, as you say, are are common to many of the European member states. So you spoke a lot about partnerships and uh, getting the right players on board. Uh, how can actors from different energy sectors uh, be encouraged to work together and achieve mm -hmm. the goals of uh, energy integration? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my company has really uh, strong attention to cross-border projects. We, we really appear on many platforms. We have a lot of flexibility projects. We are many times Horizon 2020 uh, funded. And as a TSO, uh, I could say that, uh, yes, this is an important platform. We have to go cross-border. We have to explore all these new possibilities which uh, European Union is given. But in, 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 the, in the case of cross-sector transformation, uh, I really believe we have to go even in, in a more uh, collaborative partnerships. And uh, from my experience and from our experience as, as a company, going into investment project partnerships, that is really the final stage which you have to do. Because when you go into investments, then all these elements of pilots and research and all that part, and then you really start talking with the real customers, with the real retailers, with, with everyone on the business side, and you push something which has to spread around. And, and that is something what we should not forget. And, and this is why we believe that we have to do it or create or design it from the very beginning in this way. Absolutely. And kind of taking a step back. So what do you think are the main needs of the electricity system in terms of flexibility and how can district heating and cooling help meet the needs of uh, TSOs and different member states? This is a question for both of you. Maybe we'll go to Yorosh first and Johan, perhaps you can outline how you see the role of district heating and cooling in a highly integrated system afterwards. Yeah, one part for me is uh, this daily flexibility, which is needed on a constant basis. And, and, and on this part, I would say that uh, there are different possibilities existing. We shouldn't forget about electricity storage, which is uh, actually quite well 
covering this this shorter time perspectives. But uh, but once we go into these seasonal uh, deviations, or when we think about how we can use DHC in combination of storage and 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 do these uh, exercises, I think uh, DHC systems have extreme uh, advantage in this part. So if we want to uh, have something which goes also in the direction of resilient flexibility, so that it is available when when we have problems with renewable energy, I think uh, the heating system here really are important and uh, key player. I, I can only agree. And heating and cooling systems in general have lots and lots of thermal inertia and uh, is by the very nature very flexible. So you can use them to shift a lot of heat demands in time. And thanks to that, they can both be a producer of electricity through combined heat and power and the net consumer for heat pumps or even direct electrical heating they can they can be a very very flexible actor on the in the electrical system and today they traditionally act on the day ahead market but i think they should move towards also be more active on intraday market and also like balancing and, and regulating markets as well Absolutely. And you briefly mentioned storage there, but do you think is thermal storage being utilized effectively to maximize the flexibility within the system? And what can we do to encourage um, the development of seasonal storage um, to, to meet um, uh, the mismatch between heating and cooling demands mm -hmm. in different seasons? Yeah. So if, if you take this optimization exercise seriously, uh, and if you check the background, uh, all the alternatives available, you will see if storage is playing out for you or not. So it's always case by case. You cannot say that storage is a, is a uh, even seasonal storage can be a solution for every situation. Uh, but but what I, I think is, is also very important is that um, uh, this uh, uh, storage part is, is very well designed in, in line with the flexibility needs and that it also reflects in the infrastructure. So yes, we have to run the, the operational scenarios for optimization of flexibility, but having in mind that we also can impact the, the, the device aspect. So, so what are we investing in? So for example, uh, having a strong connection to heating network and having a strong connection to electricity grid both has some costs related to it. You know? And we cannot just talk about storage and flexibility without looking also into this uh, aspect of, of infrastructure cost. Yeah. I can fill in some extra thoughts here. Like a lot of heating and cooling systems have built physical large storage tanks. In a Swedish uh, perspective, about 75% of the grids have this. And they have traditionally built it mostly to be a security of supply in case of a boiler boiler failure. And they use it to like a little bit balance out uh, the daily heat demand, but not, as, not at all as much as they could use it to run their CHPs and, and heat pumps and boilers uh, according to help them balance the electrical grid. And I think here you can, if you do careful planning and optimization, um, you can take both the securities of supply aspect and the balancing aspect into consideration at the same time. It's just that you depend on, on how large the demand is the coming days. You reserve a, a different share of the storage tank as a security of supply. So the coldest week in the winter, you might want to secure a lot, but for other times you can just maybe keep 25% of the storage tank as a security of supply and use the rest just for pure optimization of uh, CHP towards the electrical grid. So it's, I think it's a huge uh, opportunity and there's so much flexibility that is already built and not fully utilized. Absolutely. And then maybe a question for you, Rush, just in terms of that kind of high level approach. So what, what do you think needs to be done at the policy or planning level to enable widespread energy integration? Mm -hmm. So uh, from the flexibility point of view, the main challenge is that uh, it looks you know, like this demand for services is already there. 
on electricity part, but in, in, in reality, a lot of these services are today supplied with extremely cheap sources. We still have a lot of uh, thermal generation, which also supplies uh, this, this flexibility. And, and, and this is, is the problem which actually is just waiting to explode, you know, because at a certain point in the future, thermal will go out and then the need for flexibility will be increased and then everything will fall apart and, and we will need uh, these solutions which we talk about here. Uh, but it, uh, it, in addition to this, um, in the policy perspective, of course, we, we cannot simply remove all the sources tomorrow. You know? We have to take this gradual approach and be ready. And we should believe that, uh, that this time when these sources will be really key uh, will come. And, and uh, that's also our role, that, that, we, that we see these relations and that we see that if the uh, uh, thermal generation is gone away, that, that, that this flexibility actually will be needed. Uh, but in policy terms, I think um, uh, we should not rely too much on the policies as such, because the, the system, the optimization algorithms and the solutions are, are so complex and they are so, I, I think, tricky also to even to think about from the, from the engineering point of view, that if we just wait for the right policy, it might maybe never occur. You know? So we should somehow support these policies with the right uh, I think uh, projects and uh, research and uh, as I say also with investment projects and with these strong partnerships which can boost uh, everything. Uh, but you know uh, in, in, in my experience if, if uh, in industry if, uh, if the um, uh, grid operators if all this environment co comes to the government with the right solutions who will not support that you know I, I don't see any government who wouldn't support that. Absolutely. And Johan, there's a question from the audience just about um, whether or not you plan to commercialize the tool developed within the FlexiSync project, but also could you address that, but also can we expand a bit on that? So have you developed a, a business model in place to, uh, to share the benefits of, um, of operating demand flexibility between the different actors involved? Uh, yes, this is something we've worked quite a lot with, and I should say that uh, what we do in, in, in FlexiSync, it won't end up like one big tool. It's many different tools like the forecasting service, the uh, optimization model, the flexibility control in the buildings. And uh, they are all developed to work good together, but also work together with solutions that is already there in, in buildings and at energy companies. And some of these tools are already, already commercialized. For example, demand, the demand forecasting tool, uh, that is something that's already used by a number of, of energy companies. And if we look at the um, energy system modeling tool, it's today used for uh, planning investments, but it's not ready yet to be used in daily op operation. But that is something that um, we will definitely have a uh, commercialization, a commercial offer uh, for uh, by the end of the project. And a lot of these components is built in a fully scalable cloud solution. So it's built to be scaled up to 10 or 100 or even a, a thousand uh, systems. It automatically scales and start more, uh, more servers and expand the data storage as more and more systems uh, are connected. And the extra job of connecting one more grid is fairly simple. It's hook up the data source and do a new config file for the, for the production site. And you can be good to go fairly, fairly quickly. Great, sounds really interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, we're moving towards the end of the discussion now. As a final um, question, and as kind of to lead into your concluding remarks, um, what would be your key recommendations uh, to accelerate the integration of uh, different energy sectors? I think we can start with Johan. We'll go in order of the presentations. Um, I think one thing that everybody should keep in mind, regardless of what you're doing, is that you should always have the system perspective in mind. And you should have it with a fairly high time resolution that that's not not only look at the, the sum of the energy over the whole year when you calculate it from a system perspective high time high time resolution regardless if the policies um, 
calculate it in that way uh, or not. And the, the other part is that all these digital tools that are coming, uh, it, they are becoming more uh, like a, a SaaS software as a service nature. So it's fairly easy and quick to test them. So for energy systems uh, operators and so, um, don't do too much thinking. Well, of course, you're thinking before, but also uh, test a couple of different uh, solutions uh, and evaluate them and, and take it uh, from there. Just before we go to you, Rush, there's just one final question from the audience. It's directed towards Johan. So how is the flexibility of the buildings connected to the network evaluated and monitored? Um, so... We, we have a, a model for the, the flexibility uh, in the building and that is connected to system in the buildings with ha which have a lot of meters and that control that continu continually monitors the system uh, in the building and guarantees that it doesn't go outside constraints for good indoor uh, climate. So uh, for that we have a pretty good model and then for the energy system planning uh, we run an optimization with the flexibility. And then at the same time, we also run a, an optimization without utilizing the flexibility. And then we look at uh, the total operational cost for each time we run the optimization. And then we can see how much value did the flexibility add. That's, that's one part. And then afterwards, we also evaluate that the flexibility was actually controlled in the way that we planned and, and requested to ensure that we actually get this, this value in the real oper operation. Great, thank you, Johan. And that's you, Rush, for, uh, for the final, final yeah. words. Okay, because I come from the utility company, I think I have to take this perspective, what utility companies can do more to, to let's say, to enable the future where cross-sector solutions are really used and uh, being explored and uh, are reducing the price of electricity for users and uh, and heating for the users and all these energy uh, costs. Uh, I think the main the main element here is really to step a little bit outside the comfort zone for us <laughs> uh, to start experiment. Uh, probably you all tried to invite uh, some of the utilities into these research uh, pilots and programs, and uh, you you know that sometimes it, it's quite uh, uh, hard yeah, to, to get this full support and commitment uh, from this. So I think, I think the time has come that utility companies actually are aware that, uh, that we have to get out of this comfort zone, that we have to search for the solutions on the boundaries. And, um, and if, if we really follow the, the science, if we follow the, the common sense, uh, if we see, as, as uh, Johan says, uh, the whole system, I don't, uh, we don't talk about the power or, or the heat, we have to talk about the whole energy system and energy related systems. Uh, and if we really support these movements uh, coming around, also being supported by European Union, I think, I think we can do it right, yeah. Absolutely. I think I'll echo both your comments that we need a system level approach and it's time to get out of our comfort zone. Um, so yeah, I think we can close it here. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to both of our speakers for two really interesting presentations and a great discussion, um, as well as to all of our audience. I hope you'll all join us for the networking session, um, which kicks off at 3.15, which is in 20 minutes, depending on your time zone. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you all there. So thank you to Johan and Jurash again. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.